if we look at use cases, we really look at a, a few different use cases. And the first one, and we've talked a lot about this already, is, is this enterprise connectivity use case. So moving away from this hodgepodge of, of tunnels and, and multiple different types of connectivity to connect our branch offices, our data centers, that kind of thing. What we look at with a traditional, traditional type of SD-WAN is, is you're looking at tunnels everywhere. You're looking at you know, colo facilities. You're looking at cloud service providers. You're looking at carrier neutral facilities. You're building out all of this infrastructure and then tunneling, tunneling to all of it. It just, it just becomes a, an inefficient mess. Um, what we saw with, with the diagrams that Ali, Ali has shared is doing this using, using the, the Graphiant network edge service and using the, the Graphiant stateless core becomes very, very clean. You're not looking at pulling in colo, colo connections to, to connect to clouds. You're not looking at using multiple different types of, of connectivity. You're not looking at keeping MPLS because you need that S SLA. We're delivering all of that, We're delivering that cleanly, simply based on business policy. And what we have seen with early enterprise customers from a, from a costing perspective is 65, 67% lower TCO on this type of service and in this type of network. Okay. Ali just talked about this. So when we're looking at business to business connectivity, looking at building these, these DMZs, these firewall sandwiches with, with connectivity in the middle. We were talking to, uh, to a healthcare customer, it's actually on the, on the payer side, who said, this is a nightmare. We take space in colo facilities, we have racks upon racks upon racks. All of our partners have to, to build connectivity into those colos. We have connectivity in, we have the firewall sandwich, we map everything through that DMZ and it's just expensive, it's static and, it, and it's operationally heavy to maintain. What we have built with this ability to use those metadata tags and program paths based on those metadata tags is very, very clean business to business connectivity. So now all we need to do is program a tag across that, that Graphian stateless core to map those connections together. Now, you're still gonna want firewalls on your side, right? To, to control that traffic, but we take care of that mapping in the middle for you. The question becomes, okay, I'm Graphient, but they're not Graphient. What do we do? So we'll be able to use gateway functionality. So they will build an IPsec tunnel to one of our gateways, and then we'll map that traffic for you from there. Now, when Graphian's world dominant and we're everywhere, it's, it's very clean, right? And, and easy to do that way. But that interim step, Ali said, there's no such thing as a greenfield, spot on. That interim step is that, that gateway functionality. So your business partner builds that tunnel. So, so what you're describing there is very normal in healthcare. I mean, um, but not, I'm looking at it from a hospital point of view. E you know, each major hospital system has hundreds uh, of VPN tunnels to all of their partners uh -huh. for, Siemens and Roche and all these different companies, but then also all of the independent doctors, the doctor clinics, et cetera, Pay payers to, to be able to, to shove HL7 information, PAX information back and forth, yep. port hardware and all that. So you're saying that, let, let, let's say, you know, hospital XYZ to set, you know, says, yep, we want to go to Graphient. Mm -hmm. You'll manage all the IPsec tunnels that go to all their partners? I will manage it at that gateway. So I'm not managing. Watch out, your door's gonna get knocked down real fast. So be ready. Awesome. Because that, that is a number one problem in hospitals. I mean, we have engineers in every hospital system we work with, that's all they do all day mm -hmm. is move ad changes of VPN firewalls. Absolutely. And, and, and the challenge is you're building those IPsec tunnels and you're building them to all of the hops within that network. Yep. We can build them to the edge of that network and then policy map and build those connections from there. So we're not building 800 IPsec tunnels, building one for that, for that partner. 
and then mapping them. In. I guess we're building two for redundancy, but right. but mapping them from there. Yep. Okay. On the and by the way, this use case. So the so the cost save, the lower TCO on the enterprise connectivity, it is huge. You're spot on. This use case. I I lived in New York for a long time, so I'm a financial services guy. Um, this use case for financial services was the exact same way. Wait, I have to build or bring gear on site from all of my providers to get market data feeds or to get services from my providers. If they're just present on this network, you're telling me I can map to them? It was huge. I, I fully see that at the, the credit union I used to work at. We had an entire rack of VPN hardware. Yep. Um, and there's and there's two there's like two that everybody knows the name and everything right, yeah. but then there's another there's another forty five below that. Oh yeah. So the hardware, the 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 actual hardware we'd be bringing into our branches or you know our core data center. What does it look like from an interface point? Because at some point, you know, if we have fifty you know endpoints that we're reaching out to. Mm -hmm. Um, we're either going to need some pretty fast interfaces with some sub interface capability, right? Or just a ton of interfaces to map all these endpoints to. So we're going to connect to your network on the LAN side. So it's going to be LAN connectivity. And then we're going to connect to, to the last mile via, via that. So our connection limit is, is pretty low. If you're talking about from the, the gateway functionality, to bring your partners on, I own that. I manage that. So I'm talking about getting them into a DMZ on my firewall. So uh, how many connections are you describing for your scenario? Yeah, so let's say I'm back at the bank, right? Yep. I literally had probably 40 VPNs to different providers, you know, like financial providers that we had to maintain. Mm -hmm. um, we literally did them in individual pizza boxes or, you know, like small 5505s, depending on the connectivity we needed. Um, and each one of those individually was just plumbed into VLANs and, you know, then sub interfaces into the <laughs> firewall, you know, on 10 gig ports. And mm -hmm. yeah, so, it was a mess. <laughs> so, so, so let's do the, the map on this one. So you, let's say for ease, there's 50 that you have to bring in. So let's say 50 partners. Yeah. You typically land, it's an IPsec connection right now. You land all of them, let's say, typically into the same VRF, but just on different VLANs. Is that, am I understanding correctly? Yeah. Okay, so it's all in the same VRF, different VLANs mapped to a untrust zone on the firewall. Mm -hmm. In our model, depending on how you wanted to do this, first part, the number of VP, the IPsec connections goes down to two because you're connecting into our service. So you're not building an IPsec connection to each of your partners. Yep. So that goes away down to two. In terms of, do you want to still land all of them into the same VRF? Your choice. You could slice that up at level three if you wanted to, but sometimes that can just be operationally too heavy. You can still map it to the VLANs. Now, in terms of from us to, let's say, your firewall, do we have you know, sub-interface capacity and the ability to do that? Absolutely. If you wanted 4,000 VLANs, you can do 4,000 VLANs. Uh, so let's say each of those 50 partners, you would be able to maintain it to land them into each of their VLANs to go to your firewall stack. Now, this starts to open up a bunch of options for you because we're trying to still maintain a migration path that doesn't force you to re-architect everything, particularly your security posture, mm -hmm. right? As long as the network piece gets results, your tunnel goes away, you still land in the same VRF and you're still able to map each of those to each VLAN. You can still do that. What we can do in our part, just to, for making it super clean for us from a networking standpoint, we will land each of the partners in its own VRF, in its own zone, but we will handle the tunnel by eliminating it using tagging. So when you look at our edge boundary, it will look like just two tunnels are coming from the Graphene service, the metadata tags are different for different partners. They land in distinct VRFs. And in there, you can have your sub interface that goes to your firewall. Yeah. So your migration path isn't super onerous and you're able to get the benefit of it. Now, 
how far could you take this? This is where things become a little bit more interesting if you didn't want to do the VLAN thing into the firewall. And maybe let's say you wanted to get a security service from somebody else to scrub it before it enters your network. Yep. And that's where that comes in. So the furthest along that we're actively, because Sky High has been the most vocal about the fact that, about what we've been talking about with them, because we had this discussion with them around, we are not in the business of inspecting people's stuff. You are. You have the intelligence, the skill set, the abilities, everything. But this use case is a non-trivial use case. In the SD-WAN world, we tried an attempt at it. We called it service engineering or service chaining. And we tried to create it a certain way. And it didn't work out. It really didn't. We had maybe one deployment and it was one of the most difficult policy constructs we had ever created because the nature of the symmetry that you have to maintain in that service chain became impossible. And if you didn't have the right constructs all the way, it became impossible. So for us, the idea here was we've solved the network piece. The metadata is easy to comprehend and is extendable. But even when we talk about migration paths, your whole security posture doesn't have to change. And you can layer on an additional security service that it passes through before it comes to you without having to redo your whole network. So the, the tunnel being eliminated, the edge now cleaning up the VRS, the VPNs, all that piece gives you the flexibility to say, I can choose which SSC vendor I would like to become the broker of all my B2B connections. All of you, before you even touch my firewall stack, are going to go through Zscale or a Sky High or whomever before you even hit my edge boundary. That became the use case of particular interest to us. Yeah, for sure. I am still curious about interfaces, though. Because... Um, so interface density-wise, yeah. if I look at port counts, I think we're... Uh, so on the upper side, it would be 8 by 8 by 8 by 8. So 32, and then there is another 4. 36 interfaces, each of which can support your standard 1 to 4096 VLANs. Plus, we're looking at some of the smart NIC capabilities. So we have a bunch of offload functions as well there. This is where, again, I would say Intel has been a great partner. The NIC yeah. density that they're providing us and what we're working with them, it works out really well. Is nicely. that gig or mgig? Uh, this is MGIG. Okay. So it's, we are 1, 10, 25, 40, 100 uh, supported. We are not at the 400 gig range. Okay. So the, the other side of this management is that, of course, the uh, legacy, you know, we've always done it with multiple. So, you know, having worked at a, large hospital system, you know, similar to what he's talking about, over 100 VPN tunnels to mm -hmm. partners. Uh, but many of those partners are, are very large organizations that it's, you know, I don't have a lot of leverage with. Uh, what's your experience in, you know, whatever industries you're doing this in with big players being willing to connect other than how they've always done it? So in the healthcare and manufacturing space, things, it's been very different. Like even in the financials, but manufacturing healthcare has been particularly interesting. You're right. The big stuff is, is big and that doesn't move as quickly. But there's all these new initiatives, especially because of everything COVID has done and the supply chain crisis following that around. What, what can you do? Can you introduce new sensors or new video cameras? Or can I record surgeries and stream them? And teach robots using that and a bunch of different things. So it's not necessarily about transforming what already is there that's moving as quickly. What we're seeing is a bunch of big players coming up with these new use cases saying, we're going to use your technology to pilot this other project that we've got going on. And if you can solve that, then we're going to start looking at other things. So in the healthcare space, one of the bigger ones that we've been working on we're not actually doing surgery on the network, it is purely around video streaming from ORs. Mm -hmm. And that alone is not straightforward uh, to get into the hospital network, 
to deploy a recording system that also meets the user privacy and data anonymization and HIPAA regulatory requirements, and then stream that data somewhere. That piece is where a lot of what the engagement has been around, can we make the VPN problem go away? Because trying to VPN into each hospital, we don't wanna do that. And that even the hospital teams are resisting that, but saying that the security compliance rules say that we can't just put your appliance in, it has to have a VPN, but no one wants a VPN. So how do we do this? So this is where we've seen uh, healthcare companies say, okay, we're gonna package your edge along with this recording system and it's gonna go in. And in all honesty, both of us were like, there is no way a healthcare would take us first. Genuinely, we were shocked because we thought, okay, retail will be the first ones because they want cost savings and simplicity. Banks will be the next because they always love the new technology. Healthcare and manufacturing is gonna be slow rolling. Those two have been the fastest, like the fastest by far. Yeah, because these, these VPN hubs at the hospitals, are, 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 there's a lot of them and they're very difficult to, to, to maintain and troubleshoot. And, and But they're at the same time critical for getting stuff fixed. Yes. I mean, it's in, in my experience, it was primarily used by remote technicians with exactly. significant experience to make sure the diagnostic equipment actually gets back online and can Absolutely. do what it and, needs to do. And the biggest thing, like the outpatient stuff that's been happening, right? It's the the number of now healthcare systems saying we have to move a bunch of stuff to outpatient to remote clinical stuff we can't have everything in the central hospital because if we have another surge all of our elective surgery stop all of the the diagnostic stuff stop because we're just in crisis yeah. mode because our icus are filled up well the the image reviews from radiology or all the other imaging systems that are out there yep. you know the experts are all over the place and, exactly. and the and the image files are enormous the, the, the example ali gave earlier about the the usb key was was in that space and and it wasn't mailed they had the surgical sales rep take the usb key and plug it into their laptop and upload it I, i'm i'm a sales guy i manage sales teams i know that's not gonna happen right mm -hmm. that's gonna get forgotten about and and the image is never gonna get delivered and, and so. I think when you, it goes back to, right, the VPN concentrator, you can still deal with at the central hospital facility because it's super yeah, critical. Yeah, that's what, that's what we did, the, have 100 plus exactly. tunnels. But the, the moment vendors. you start distributing that, it becomes the, wait, how many clinics are going to get a VPN concentrator? And how many technicians can go into this? Yeah. And what do we do here? That, well, well, we had a large and, enough and, and, hospital system that that was on our internal network. <laughs> yeah. and, and what happens when Cisco calls it end of life and you have to replace it? That's that's true. That's the biggest TCO problem with those VPN concentrators is the life cycle on them because no one wants to ever shut them off. Yes. And God forbid if you have to change the peer IP address of them. Yes, that's true. <laughs> and it was, and and that uh, that client VPN problem, right? Even. It's so rooted into the heart of it that you, you're always home to the same location. You can't even move. Yeah, like good business to... continuity then with the you know, DR situation becomes real fun because you either have to make sure that all of your partners have tunnels to both of your sites yep. or you have to have BGP or something to bring that IP over and make sure that you've kept everything synchronized between those mm -hmm. two sets of VPN concentrators. And, and there will be someone in the networking team will be like, oh, we can use Anycast to solve it. And they're oh, like, God. how are you going to do that one? <laughs> yeah, take me out back and shoot me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, I think that's, that's spot on this use case right here as far as is programming through whatever the security service is. So you come in, we apply the tags, we send through that that SSE or whatever that security service is, and then bring it into your network. So alleviate all of that, all of that programming challenge. 